Um, thank you very much. It's a great honor to, to get to spend a little time here uh, talking to you and being a part of this. I, I wanna, uh, I'm sorry that I actually can't just be part of this on a more regular basis because uh, as hopefully came across yesterday and, and as, as should come across in that very nice introduction, this is an area that, that is very close to my heart and I'm very, very passionate about these kinds of questions and intellectually have been trying to disentangle them for some time. Now, I know that the topic of, that you guys have been exploring over the last day uh, and will continue to explore is really about institutional breakdowns or weak institutional weakness and the barriers that that creates for thinking about issues of international business. And so when Lisa asked me to talk about this topic um, and relate it to China, it was a little bit of a conundrum for me because um, I am... Uh, not only very, very bullish on what's actually going on in China, but also think very deeply about just how innovative China actually is. Now, this is a little bit of a different story than is typically given about China. And so just to kind of give you a, I always have to put, it, put this disclaimer in at the beginning of my China talks, because um, I, I like to think of the, the, the China scholarship community as that you can kind of break it down into a continuum. There are those who think that this is all a house of cards and it's all corrupt and, you know, every every uh, year there's a new person who's talking about the whole thing's going to fall apart. This last year it was James Chanos, but before that it was, you know, uh, a, a, a litany of other people in that same will. And there are those in the middle who think this is interesting, but we're not really sure what's actually going on here. And then there's there's those who are very bullish on China. And I'm like somewhere over, over here. I'm not <laughs> And, and I, am, I say that in part as a disclaimer just to kind of acknowledge where I come from on this, but I think it's a well-informed and empirically grounded position on what's actually happening in China. I've uh, spent the last quarter of a century as a China scholar now. It's uh, sort of amazing to think of it as that much time that's gone by. And I spent as much, I've lived in China, and I spend as much time in China as I can. And all of my research has been about trying to uncover what it is that's actually going on in China and how we understand the economic reforms. And because my background is in sociology, I think a lot about institutions, and so I thought, well, what can I do to talk about this topic in a way that will fit with what you're thinking about here? And so I put together a talk that has many of the standard topics that I like to talk about with respect to China, but thinks about institutions more directly, and is much more about explaining why China's reforms have been so, so successful from an institutional perspective, and thinking specifically about what it means for what is the other side of institutional breakdown, which is actually institutional innovation and, uh, and sort of where you get strong institutions and versus weak institutions. So I want to talk a little bit about that. One of the things that's often a little jarring for people when I talk about China is not only am I over on that side of the spectrum in terms of where I think China is, but I actually think uh, in the United States today, one of the interesting things about the capitalist world that we live in, uh, and it's one of the great ironies of, of our time, is that the, the largest communist society in the world is also the most dynamic capitalist economy in the world. And there's a tremendous amount that we can actually be learning from China. And so I, I, uh, this is not just a, an unwitting uh, idea that China is the most dynamic economy. It's actually, I, I, I very much believe it. Um, and so I, what I want to do is just kind of talk through some of these issues. Um, I spend a lot of time in business schools and, and, and therefore very um, used to being interrupted. So. Um, if you guys have any ideas, questions, or thoughts, please don't uh, don't stand on protocol and hold them to the end. Please feel free to interrupt at any point, and we can either clarify or go deeper on the topic. Uh, I'm really here for you uh, to talk about these issues. Now, I, I just wanted to give you a little bit of background. Um, Liesl gave uh, to talk to, uh, gave a very nice introduction. My work has been really focused on the issues of China uh, for the last quarter of a century. Um, I spent a lot of time in my early years thinking deeply about state-owned enterprises and what was driving the success of state-owned enterprises in the economic reforms in the 1980s and 1990s. Later, my work has become a little bit more, I wouldn't call it popularized, but I've really tried to attempt to actually link those to a more macro set of questions that are about how do we understand what I understood as the success, the drivers of success of state-owned enterprises and translate that into the broader macro level economic social and political transformations that are happening in Chinese society. Um, before we get deeply into 
the substantive issue, I'm sure you guys have actually spent an, a, a little bit of time over the last 24 hours talking about this question, but I always like to start as a sociologist with the question, what do we mean when we talk about institutions? Um, when we think from a sociological perspective, we generally think of the structures and systems that shape human life. The structures and systems that shape economic interactions, human interactions. Um, but there are, just to be clear, a number of different perspectives on how we should think about institutions. There is what I typically think of as the economics and rational choice driven perspectives, which would not just be the economists like Doug North, who's more of an economic historian, but really made institutional analysis famous. Uh, and I don't actually think of him so much as a rack choice economist from that time period. He was much more of a historian and I think was, was a very interesting scholar from that standpoint. But the entire neoclassical revolution that was really driven forth by Milton Friedman had a big impact on the field of political science as well in thinking about institutions. Uh, and that's a very, very rational choice driven understanding about what institutions are. The notion here is that institutions are still these systems and mechanisms that order economic decision making and social life, but it's very much based on a kind of rational set of decisions about what the, what the pluses and minuses of cost benefit analyses are in any given outcome. Sociology is a little bit of a different field from this perspective because uh, while there are, there's a small strain of rational choice theory within sociology, and it's a very small strain, what people tend to be focused more on from a sociological perspective is not the question of what the assumptions are about how humans make decisions, it's rather the notion of how people are embedded in social systems. And those social systems have rules to them, and some of those rules aggregate up to, <coughs> to institutions, and so those institutions can be either very complex, like a set of laws, or even just a set of rules that guide uh, a work site, uh, or they could be an ideological system that guides a nation, or they could even be the set of social rules that guide what you do when you shake hands with somebody over doing a deal, right? And so there are lots of different ways to think about institutions. So I just want to lay that out there uh, and make sure that we're having a, a, a complex conversation about what we mean when we talk about institutions, because I think it's a very complex top, topic, actually. Um, so now I want to dive into China. Um, and I, I want to start out by talking about a couple of conflicting images. And then I want to talk through how these conflicting images are actually shaping some things that are what I think of as interesting successes in China. And then I want to take a step back and explain where I think these successes come from, because that's actually the driver of what I think of as the institutional analysis of why China is so successful right now, and what I mean when I talk about local governments as the key driver of institutional innovation in China. China is very well known as a story of the dramatic economic transformation that has taken course here. We know, we know this story pretty well, right? Like we know this story about the, the, the developing nation that had been isolated for about 30 years under communist rule and was on, truly on the big brink of bankruptcy after the, economic, uh, after the, the cultural revolution uh, and has risen from the ashes to become the most dramatic story of transition from plan to market of any economy in the world, right? That's a story we know well. And we even know that story from the news. How many have been to China? the audience, right? Shanghai, I'm sure. Uh, so if you know that story, you know actually this kind of uh, futuristic landscape that, you know, I used to, when I was living in Shanghai in the mid-90s, I would stand out on the bund and look across to this futuristic landscape, and it was just rice fields and broken down factories. There was nothing in Pudong at that time period. And in that time period, a very short 30, 20 years, uh, we've seen just this dramatic transformation of this system. Right? And so there's a very interesting story there that's about economic transformation, economic reform. And it begs the question of what's actually going on here. Now, of course, the great coming out party uh, happened in 2008. And this was the moment in which the world uh, sort of realized that this isn't just some kind of interesting economic story that many economists are actually poo-pooing a little bit because they think, well, you know, okay, so if you're Jeffrey Sachs, your line in the 1990s was, well, you know, they didn't follow our prescriptions that we were giving them from, for economic transformations. Russia did, and that was a mistake. But China, there's a very simple story for why they actually have had the success they did, and it was because they had a deeper, cheaper labor pool than we thought, and they were less industrialized than Russia and the former Soviet empire was. And so that made this 
this kind of dramatic economic transformation more viable, right? So we underestimated these things. Turns out by 2008, we know that that story, that, that uh, kind of dismissal of what was actually happening in China is just wrong. Like it's just simply wrong. There were so many economists that got this tale completely wrong. And we've seen the amazing transformation before our eyes. Um, yet, the, the, what I call the doom and gloom view persists. And the doom and gloom view is not just, a, it's, this is an economic house of cards, but it's a, really a story about how this is a fundamentally institutionally weak system, right? Rife with corruption, uh, it's completely crazy, there's no protections for intellectual property, there's no protections for human rights and labor, there's no protections for, for any type of legal, legal infrastructure. You go into this country at your own risk and you know, be prepared to, you might make money, but you might also lose your shirt because the system just is bankrupt, right? And so every year there's sort of a new train of people who think this way. And as I mentioned, the most recent person has been James Chanos, who was famous for having shorted Enron and made a lot of money. Uh, he's completely wrong about China, by the way, and if you want to talk about why, I can tell you in a more specific, detailed way what's wrong with his analysis of China. Uh, but the main point is that we can't get the doom and gloom view of China out of our minds. Uh, we think about it with respect to the environment and pollution. We think about it with respect to the massive <coughs> amounts of waste that are being created there. We even think about it with respect to the weak political institutions, or you might think of them as a strong, powerful political institution, that institution being an authoritarian state. Right? And so there, there's a very kind of dark story that's often presented here. Um, on the other hand, there is an interesting story right now that we struggle with. What does it mean that this place, again, largest so-called communist society in the world, communist polity, uh, also one that has made this transition to a market economy, what does it mean that we are so far behind China in areas like renewable energy? What does it mean, actually, that this country has raced out in front of the United States, which actually produces most of the high t the technology in this space? Europe is probably second, and China is far ahead of all of us. Like, why is that actually happening? And here again, the story that is often told is that, well, it's such a cheaper labor pool that they're stealing our job, our, our labor, right? When you hear these stories about companies moving to China, that's basically a story of the fact that, that, that we just can't compete on labor costs, and that's really what the problem is. I think that view is very simplistic, and I think it's dangerous because it completely misunderstands a very fundamental thing about the complexity of institutional transformation and institutional innovation. So the story I want to tell is a little bit along those lines. Um, in the backdrop of this thing of China speeding ahead of renewable energy, there are interesting players to know about. I'm not an expert in renewable energy, but I've spent a lot of time thinking and talking about it recently because I'm quite interested in areas at the macro level of why China is actually doing so much better than us economically in a couple of key areas, and re renewable energy is one of them. China's basic investment in this space is interesting. But the, the more interesting question is not just about investment. The more interesting question is this conundrum of why it is that companies like DuPont will choose to actually go to China. So recently I was having this conversation with Chad Holliday, who was the chairman and CEO of, of, uh, of DuPont. Uh, he's, he's now the chairman of Bank of America, and he did a lot of interesting work when he was at DuPont. And we were sort of talking about America's falling behind in the manufacturing sector, and in particular this issue of renewable energy. And he said, let me tell you a little story that actually maps onto what it is that we're talking about here. In this country, things are really sort of broken down into this notion that the private sector should be the driving force of not only all economic development, but also institutional innovation, and we need to see that investment come from venture capital. Right? And so that's basically what's happening in the space of renewable energy. We have Barack Obama standing up on a stage and saying we do big things, but what big things are we actually really doing? Do we invest? Well, we set aside some tax credits, and that's great. But if you're DuPont and you want to set up a new photovoltaic plant, who do you turn to? How do you actually get the government to actually be a partner in a process that is a very, very complex economic development process? You need institutional structures and systems that are actually going to help be the stewards of that economic development process, right? So Chad is doing one of his last deals at DuPont, and he's trying to figure out where they're going to build their next photovoltaic array plant thinks it would be great to do it in the United States, but really doesn't see the kind of facilitated way of working with the government to actually build this infrastructure. There's no federally guaranteed loans, there's no guaranteed procurement, et cetera, et cetera. Singapore and China, both hear that DuPont is in the market for a new plant. 
They both start pursuing them aggressively. Eventually, uh, the, the Guangdong, Guangzhou government wins out. They put together a deal in which they'll build a plant in Guangzhou uh, and have a, you know, a plant across the border in Hong Kong so that that will be their research facility. Very, very nice deal, very, very generous. It's great for DuPont. Then the economic crisis hits. The economic crisis means that people like Chad have to think about what are we going to do actually to, to ensure the viability of DuPont. And we need to scale back. We don't need six football field research facility, maybe three football fields is fine. So they kind of start signaling to the Chinese government, we're going to scale back a little bit. Uh, and the Chinese government says, whoa, 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 why? We're very excited about this partnership. What, what, what do you need? Well, two years guaranteed procurement would be great. Done. Done. Don't even worry. Everything's going to be taken care of because we know the development of this sector actually requires investment. And before we have kind of the, the infrastructure up in place, we're actually going to have to be the stewards of this process, right? So that's kind of an interesting thing because it tells a story about innovative local governments that are aggressive parts of economic development. And that's really the story that I want to tell you today. Let me give you another quick story because this one's actually been in the news and it's just to kind of shore up the argument that we're making here about what it means for local governments to be aggressive in the development process. We've been reading a lot in the news also in renewable energy about Evergreen Solar, which left Massachusetts fairly recently because uh, it just couldn't survive economically. Uh, and here again, the story that was most of the reported in the New York Times and other places was that China has stolen yet another company. Um, now in this case, it's interesting to know because one of the things that was rarely reported here was that Evergreen Solar's about one-sixth or one-seventh of its bond issuance was through Lehman Brothers. When Lehman Brothers went under, so did all of that capital, right? Now, Evergreen Solar then went after the TARP money and they said, well, can we get TARP money because we need to stay viable. And the U.S. government said, no, uh, we've given, you're not a financial institution, that TARP money is going to financial institutions. And Evergreen Solar said, well, they're not lending. Like, we, you know, can you make them lend? Can you give us a federally guaranteed loan? And, you know, the answer was no, 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 no. Uh, and we're not going to guarantee procurement. And then, uh, eventually, they left for China. Right? So this is actually, I think, a very interesting story. It's a little off the beaten track of what we're talking about, but I just phrase it here to illustrate the fact that developing economies takes active, aggressive development from the state, and the state then becomes the innovative force in pushing forward new economic models. And those, under those new economic models come the kinds of institutional innovation that really matters. So how do we understand the China puzzle, and why is this related to this issue of institutional innovation and change? Okay, so here I want to take a step back, talk a little bit about what I think the models for economic development are in China, and why the issue is really <coughs> crucial to be framed, or it's crucial to frame the issue in terms of local governments and institutional innovation. So there's many different images that we might think of when we think of China, right? We might think of, you know, this, this agricultural system that doesn't have a Great Plains. We might think of it as this country that kind of built a wall around itself in the 7th and 8th century. We might think about it in conflict with the West. We think about Mao Zedong. Uh, more recently, this is actually a country that has just become fascinating in terms of the kind of mixed structures and systems that it has put together to build this system. Now, the real markers of this story, or the, 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 the kind of key beginning points, are really here. 1979, Deng Xiaoping comes to power. He's an ultimate pragmatist. He's still an authoritarian communist. But what he really understands clearly is that if we are going to be successful, we need to be aggressive, we need to adapt, we need to use models from the West, and we need to, above all, be pragmatic. Okay, so it comes to visit Jimmy Carter. Uh, the, the real story then picks up speed from 1979 on in, in uh, 2001, when China basically uh, is finally stops being held hostage by the US, the US from entry into the WTO, uh, and, and they, they gain entry into the system and the, the economy really opens up. Now, the key things that I like to think about in understanding this paradox, so we have this paradox of discussion. If you put on one hand, the people who are, this is a house of cards type of approach. On the other hand, if that's true, how is it the case that this has been far and away the most successful case of economic development in 30 years of, and in a large number of countries that have attempted to make the transition from plan to market? So I like to emphasize six key 
features of this. And the first two of them mix in interesting ways to really drive forward a process of institutional innovation. Right? So this is a system that is not built on ideology. The institutions here do not have any kind of core features that we would think of as, as that are central to our core features of institutions. Right? So in the US, we have a basic understanding that the core underlying system that economics needs to be based on is, or, or that a market economy needs to be based on is private property. Right? In China, there is no simplistic understanding of that. And so what I'd like to do now is just talk through each of these areas and show how they actually come together to create institutional innovation at the local government level. Now, the, the sidebar here that is interesting, and this may be sort of hitting one of the bigger themes of what you've been discussing over the course of the, of, of the, the, of the last 24 hours, is that there is a message that doing business in China as an international manager means that you have to have a deep understanding of local institutional conditions. There are some places in China that are horrible institutionally and some places that are great, but it's all a very localized process. So we need to deeply understand where each, each area is about and then actually understand the institutional conditions thereof. Now, the processes that have driven that forward, I like to break that into six key buckets. Gradualism, decentralization, an openness to foreign direct investment, a governizing strategy that really focuses on cross-industry coordination, the gradual emergence of a private economy that then competes with the state-guided system, and then the quiet revolution of other more, what we might think of, democratic institutions. So let me tackle the first one of these first. Gradualism, I think, is probably the most interesting feature. It's not actually the most hidden feature, I'm going to talk about that in a second, but it's the most interesting feature of the Chinese process of institutional change. So I like to think of it this way. In the United States, and I'm you know, a little bit using Jeff Sachs and, and Stiglitz and a couple of others as straw men in this, but let me just do that because you know, even though Sachs would like to claim that Russia just got his advice wrong, it was his advice, right? The shock therapy was Jeff Sachs' idea, right? Okay, so you know, as much as he's kind of changed the tune over the years and, and talks about the importance of institutions and everything, like, you know, this was his baby. So the basic model was you go through your theoretical mathematical modeling and you have a core set of ideas that drive the institutional system forward. And then you basically release those to the policy community and say, this is what the institutions need to look like. Right? So think about shock therapy and the transition from plan to market in Russia. Think about the ways in which we actually uh, debate economic systems in state versus market in the United States. There are many different examples of how these two should work. In China, in China, the system is completely the opposite. In China, there is no process of top-down institutional agenda, institution agenda setting. Instead, the system is very much what we might think of as bottom-up and it's really built into the entire gradualist logic of how the economic transformation process has happened. Right? Now, what does that mean? What it means is that what the government does is they constantly are thinking about experimenting with a number of different models. And they do that this all at different localities. And those different institutional models then are part of a feedback loop that then are a process that are then built into a process of building the institutions very gradually. In China, they like to talk about the economic reforms. So this comes from Deng Xiaoping, but there's a famous say, saying that he uses, uh, which in Chinese is mo shi guo, which means that um, I like to translate it as groping for stones to cross the river. Right? So over there, you know what you want to get to. You want to get to economic success. You want to get to you know, wealth, prosperity, global power. But how you get there, how you get across the river, is a process of wading through the river and gradually stepping on each stone until you figure out what the next set of stones are going to be and where the rapids in the river are, right? And you might actually end up upstream a little bit because you're not really sure how you're going to get there. So let me give you a concrete example. Uh, when I was living in China in the early 1990s, um, there was a lot of frustration because China hadn't passed a labor law. Right? And there was particularly a lot of frustration from the human rights community. It was the time of the most favored nation debate. People were talking about how this authoritarian government was so antagonistic to human rights and labor. Uh, and China, the leaders kept saying, we're, 
we're doing it. We're getting to it. Just give us some time. We're just, this is a gradual process. We're trying to figure it out. And people like Jeff Sachs would often write these articles that would say, it's not difficult. The models are out there. They exist in the capitalist West. We are the best at this. Pick one and put it in place. Now, what most people didn't realize was that since 1983, China had been experimenting with labor contracts and many other different types of things that they had taken from German American and American labor law. And they had sent these down to 31 different provincial areas and even below that to the, to the local municipalities. And they were getting practice at figuring out how these things were actually working on the ground. Right? And that system would go into this feedback loop and they kind of worked through what it was. So when they passed a, a labor law in 1994, they've already had 10 years of practice and feedback with what that process, what that law was actually going to look like. Right? So it's a very ground up institution building process. And it's very important to note that it allows for experimentation. Experimentation allows you to do things in innovative ways. Uh, and I think it's just a completely different mindset in terms of thinking about institutional change. And it's one that has constantly fascinated me in the Chinese system. It makes it look like they're very slow and recalcitrant on change. But the reality is that that institutional management, that institutional innovation is constantly happening. Now, it's also constantly happening in a context that is, in my opinion, the, the hidden secret sauce of what has been so made China so successful. We often talk about China, right? Why isn't Beijing doing this? Why isn't China doing this? There is no China, right? China is so much more decentralized and fractured than the United States is. And the United States is actually a pretty powerfully federalist system, right? The state, state's rights is a pretty powerful concept here. It's nothing compared to the decentralization in China, right? In China, Beijing has very little power. Now, Beijing has some ultimate authority on a couple of key things, but the key way to understand China is 31 provincial level jurisdictions and many, many other municipal level systems that are quite large. I mean, there's the, the population of these areas is quite significant. Uh, but they are all completely decentralized and in competition with each other. So when Jeff Sachs and other economists say the core to a market economy is private property, wrong. That is not correct. China did not use private property, a la Russia, to get to a market economy. They used competition. The core to economic development in a market, a viable market economy, has nothing to do with private property. It has to do with competition, right? And we know that, for example, even in our own case, when you have massive automobile companies that operate as an oligopoly, it doesn't matter if they're private or state-owned. They're going to be inefficient no matter what, right? The issue is competition. Now, what China did is rather than privatize, they localized. Right? They basically gave the property rights over to the localities and said, it's your game now. And you're all in competition with each other. And you better figure out how to do this, because if you don't, you're going to lose economically, and everybody, you're gonna, your people are going to be out on the streets, and they're going to be rioting. Right? And so it created a dynamic in which all of these localities were in direct competition with each other. Now this is what has led to what I like to think of as the, the, the second tier city phenomenon in China. And um, this is in some ways a little bit of a sidebar, um, but I, it's a, it, I say it to everybody who, who I talk to who's investing in China and trying to get their hands on what's going on in China. The really interesting thing today in China, and again this is part of what James Chanos gets completely wrong, if you go to Shanghai and Beijing you see a lot of empty, empty uh, and, and the office space, and we think, wow, the overcapacity here is amazing. These guys have totally screwed up. The problem is that Shanghai and Beijing are not the story of China anymore. The story of China is Suzhou, Xi'an, Dalian, Chengdu. In Chengdu, where the Intel has now moved its headquarters to, they're putting a thousand cars on the road a day. A thousand cars a day. Think about what that means in terms of what the economic vitality of that system is. Now, it's an interesting thing in terms of the relationship between Chengdu and Chongqing. Here we get this feature of this local competition. Chongqing actually thought it was going to be the gateway to the West in the Western Economic Development Strategy, which is why Chongqing became a provincial level municipality about a decade ago. But Chongqing stinks in terms of its institutions, right? It is a corrupt place and it ha actually has never been effective in its local economic development. And so you notice that most of this economic development is going to Chengdu. Right? And so you start to see how this competition then leads to institutional innovation and it gives you a better sense of really how economic transformation happens. Now let me give you a couple of key 
examples of how this happens. Okay, I'm going to just give you two quick examples and then move on. Um, one of my favorite places, so those who raise their hands and have been in China, I'm sure you've seen, you stood on the bun in Shanghai, seen Pudong. The better story is 100 miles west. Go to the Suzhou Industrial Park. This place is amazing. This place is the most institutionally stable and structured place within China. Many of the managers who work there will not just say, this is the best place to do business in China. They'll say, this is the best place to do business anywhere in the world. And part of the reason is because of a very interesting type of institutional structure and the, the features of that institutional structure that have been really quite innovative. Uh, so in the early 1990s, there was this um, competition, basically, between Jiangsu Province and Shanghai. Shanghai is an independent provincial level municipality, so it has the equal in power to Jiangsu Province. Right? Now, property values were becoming very expensive in Shanghai, and Shanghai was nervous that companies were going to move up the Yangtze River to Nanjing. So they wanted to make life difficult for Jiangsu. Right? They didn't want people to do that. So they made it very difficult to travel in between the two places. I remember one time I was trying to buy, buy a plane ticket from the Hongqiao airport to Nanjing, and they were like, we don't fly to Nanjing. And I was like, what, no flights to Mark today? Or, like, no, we just don't fly there, because we don't want people to go there. And so, sorry. <laughs> and I was like, what, what is this? But you can do that in a place that's incredibly decentralized and in vicious competition with each other, right? But Suzhou is much closer to Shanghai. It was typically, the, it was this garden city that many Qing Dynasty officials had set up their summer homes in, and it was famous for, you know, people would take uh, day trips from Shanghai to Suzhou. Right? <coughs> Suzhou, in the early 1990s, with the help of the Jiangsu government, got a $9 billion investment from the Singaporean government to build this, based on a landfill, there was nothing there. And they built this industrial park that is an unbelievable place in terms of its institutional infrastructure, in terms of how the rules and systems work. And they, of course, learned a lot from Singapore, which, by the way, if you talk to people in the business community, well, they will tell you that place is the most institutionally stable and non-corrupt place to do business in the world, right? So make no mistake about this. Democracy does not equal institutionally stable, right? Those two things are often confused. Uh, very little to do with each other. Singapore is the least corrupt place that you can do business in in the world. Um, but Suzhou learned a lot from that process, and they became very institutional innovative in terms of thinking about how you do processes the right way, how you build the right infrastructure to make to be a business-friendly place, even how you actually make things very efficient within the structure and the system. Uh, uh, and then, even from a governance perspective, when the, 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 the Suzhou Industrial Park Commission goes public on the Singaporean Stock Exchange, you have a very interesting kind of hybrid of public-private partnerships that are then accountable economically uh, to, to publicly traded markets. Uh, and it's just a, it's a fascinating type of process to see that kind of development. I mentioned Chengdu. Chengdu is another interesting place uh, from an institutional perspective. And, and they've similarly done it um, through these, through these high-tech parks that, that are very controllable, very tied to the foreign direct investment, and then very aggressive in terms of building good business systems and good, good business environments. Uh, so here again, we have this interesting thing. It's not just that China is the most dynamic capitalist economy in the world, but I fear today that it's actually a lot more business friendly than, say, doing business in the District of Columbia, which is absolutely true. Which is, I'm stunned the more I learn about this place, about how unbusiness friendly this place is. But there are a lot of places in the United States, actually, that I think are, we're at risk of that, of that process coming through. Now, just to give you one, one thing, though, though, when we talk about provincial level governments that are, you know, there are 31 of those, and then there are also a lot of municipal level governments that have a lot of, of a high, high population and economic capital. I always think this comparison is interesting. If you just give a sense of the, the population centers that have more than a million people, the difference here is just tremendous. I mean, we just have a very, very different type of, of competition that's going on within the system. And again, you have to kind of drill down deep to figure out what places are structured well institutionally and what places are not. Now, I want to hit on a couple of other key points and then I'll wrap up. Um, I also think that if you are going to have a very decentralized system, you also still need cross-industry strategizing. It's something that the United States actually used to do pretty well, but we don't do it well anymore. Um, but you need governmental bodies that are thinking about things like energy policy. We used to actually do it very well. It's why, it's why the transportation network was built in, to support the automobile industry. 
uh, we've sort of lost our way in doing that, but you still need that process, right? So one of the big risks of decentralization is you get a lot of, while you'll get a lot of institutional innovation, you may have no center holding the entire thing together strategically. So that's, that's actually a, an important part of this. Uh, and it's one of the things that leads to kinds of coordination that, that China gets bashed for is being called China Inc. You'll hear this from a lot. I'm sure Rob hears this from people talking in the, in the oil industry, because I hear it from people who are working in Africa all the time. They say, how can we compete? We're just Royal Dutch Shell trying to get a contract here. And China comes in with not just PetroChina, but they come in with Air China and the China Construction Bank and all of the things that actually come along with it. And so that kind of cross-industry subsidizing and cross-industry strategizing, uh, I think, is a very powerful piece of this. It's also important, though, to really understand the relationship between FDI and institutional innovation and change. And so one of the drivers of this process of institutional innovation is the incentive of landing foreign capital, right? So managers actually have a huge amount of leverage within this system because you can actually use that leverage to say, no, I'm not actually, I'm not gonna do a deal in Chongqing, I'm gonna do it in, I mean, the fact that Intel moved their Chinese headquarters to Chengdu completely changed the dynamic of economic development in Chongqing because in China and around the world, people view Intel as just like, one of the most upstanding companies that makes the right decisions and they have absolutely no tolerance for bribery and those sorts of things. Uh, and they changed the game because they actually gave so much credibility to the Chengdu government because they decided these are the guys that we want to work with. So you do have a lot of leverage, at least at the high level of that system. Uh, two other things in China worth mentioning. It's important to note, though, that although we talk about, I talk about China as a place that decided on localization rather than privatization, which is true, um, but that doesn't mean China doesn't have a huge and vibrant private economy, right? You need both of these things to actually kind of work from both sides. So you have a transforming state economy from above, but you also have a vibrant private economy from below. Which my, all the estimates I always use are very conservative. So in China today, actually, the, the estimates on the, the, the decline of the state economy is way off usually because pe typically people frame the state economy like PetroChina because it's a joint stock company. They'll call it a private company, which is absolutely not true. It's a state-owned company. But if you do conservative estimates of the numbers, and these are the conservative estimates, you still have a private economy of, you know, 100 plus million people, right? So that's like almost the size of the U.S. labor force. So it's not that China doesn't have a vibrant private economy to actually kind of create the competition of a market economy that leads to institutional innovation, but it's just a much more complex one uh, in that system. Uh, and then the final thing that is, of course, important here is that you can't get institutional innovation and change without really having an evolution of the political system. Uh, and I often think that China gets a little bit less credit than it should in terms of the transformation that's going up there. I won't talk much about that, but I'm happy to, to, to leave some time for questions if people are curious about that issue. Uh, so just to, to summarize here, um, I, I think one of the things that I like to think about with respect to institutional innovation is that this idea that these things can only come from the private sector. Uh, I actually think that um, institutional innovation comes from lots of different areas, but it has very little to do with private property. It does have to do with competition, and the fact that competition really drives uh, whether it's local governments or, or, or uh, local constituencies to, to really be innovative in how they think about structuring economic practices, practices, I think it can come from many different areas. Now, the final thing that I just want to say about China is that in my view, China's not a story of, of, of cheap labor and a tremendous amount of wealth that, that rose from a country exporting its way out of poverty. This is actually a story that's a radical story of institutional innovation, and it's one that has, in my view, could and, and should and is completely changing our understanding of how economic development occurs. When you put together gradualism with decentralization and the competition that arises there, you get a very, very potent mix of radical institutional innovation at the local level, but then when you mix that with coordinating bodies that are that are kind of uh, knitted throughout the system, I think you get a very, very powerful kind of economy. So there's that's sort of what I want to talk about here. And the final thing is that hopefully this is a story of not just singing Chinese praises, but the bigger uh, story or the more specific story to understand about China is there is no China. There is no one China. There is uh, There are pockets of real institutional strength and weakness and if you really want to understand what's going on in China, you need to deeply understand the institutional infrastructure and the fabric uh, and, and really, really understand from that perspective.